this is perhaps the oddest human I've ever encountered, and you'd think the Cortison episodes would be the most sexual on here. Today we have Elsa von Freytag Lorienhoven, the woman who once used a giant dildo in one of her theatrics. Amazing. There's apparently now a plaster cast of it, that or it was made of plaster. Either way, we'll start at the beginning. Where would such a woman get her start? Surprisingly, in a Prussian town, a Prussian military town, that is now part of Poland uh, since the Prussian Empire fell in the aftermath of World War I. She was born July 12, 1874. Her father was an entrepreneur, apparently quite important in their small town. Do we know However, what his business was? He is described as a maverick entrepreneur, builder, and contractor. Hmm. So, construction, probably? There is also, however, a family history of alcoholism, depression, and romanticized suicide in her grandparents. Oof, so that does not bode well. No, and this was used to point out why Elsa wouldn't be normal later on. Uh, so other people were making that excuse of, like, oh, it runs in the family. Yes, runs in the whole family because her mother and father also were not entirely all right. Mm -hmm. However, we don't actually have much information about her early life. A lot of it is gleaned between fictionalized lines and quite possibly dramatized autobiography from decades later. Mm, so she is, as other women that we've seen previously, she is a myth maker. I wouldn't go so far as to say myth maker, but like a lot of the people we've covered uses her own life to create art. So using her own experiences to then write stories. Mm -hmm. As mentioned earlier, there's a whole lot of trauma in this family. Her father may have infected her mother with syphilis, for instance, Oof. and he also may have been abusive. It's unclear from the writing. It's also said he was fond of body jokes that his daughter then co-opted. Yeah, so I can definitely see where, in talking about her life, she would be um, using kind of a filter between the, the literal happenings and what she told people. We do know she started writing poetry at about the age of 12. She was already experimenting with language and roles in it. She liked satire as well. It probably influenced her, and also, she wasn't shy about sex topics the way everyone else was. For instance, she recalls sitting on a Chinese naval officer's knee at age eight or nine while he sang dirty songs and played the piano. Huh, so, and this, this was something that her parents were tolerating as well, it sounds like? Yes, well, keep in mind, her father told very bawdy jokes. Yeah, so that's just kind of the culture she's growing up in. Yes, which is very odd, actually, for a Prussian, mm -hmm. or in a Prussian military town, as we will see. We also know that by age 12, she found androgyny interesting, as well as the daughter of a military officer. Yeah, did it go anywhere? A little bit. Apparently being Catholic made her exotic to Elsa. Mm -hmm. She once dared her to flirt with the local priest to test his vow of celibacy. When the Catholic refused, Elsa did it herself. It is assumed the priest did nothing in response to this, but Elsa did it almost out of a duty after having made the suggestion. Well, we'll, we'll hope nothing happened. She then attended an upper-class all-girls school. Uh, the only male in the school was the principal, and the school itself was filled with the daughters of military officers and minor government officials. Huh, so, uh, just her type. <laughs> yes, but schooling wasn't all that interesting, it seems. She was an underachiever, more interested in jokes and satire than in scholastics. I personally am picturing an environment similar to the school in Machen in Uniform, Translation is Girls in Uniform. It's a German 1931 lesbian movie set in a Prussian girls' school before World War I. 
there's a great deal of strict discipline. I imagine Elsa did not do very well in such Mm -hmm. an environment. Yeah, sounds very restrictive. Anyway, she graduated in 1890 and promptly left for Berlin. Yeah, sounds like the environment you'd want to just escape. She then lived with her aunt while training to be an art teacher. However, she only completed one term out of the four necessary for the two-year certificate. And then she left Berlin in 1891, as her mother was too ill to continue lobbying her father for school fees. Wow, love that father. Her mother would die in February 1893. There was belated mourning a few months later, and then her father quickly remarried. She was quite bewildered by this. Yeah, that just doesn't sound like a great situation. She then ended up back in Berlin soon after, where she answered an ad looking for girls with good figures and ended up at Vaudeville Theatre. Well, thank goodness it's a theater job. You remember our connection made in earlier episodes where I pointed out the social perception, we'll say, of theater and prostitution? Right. Yes. Well, you see, the job she got involved very skin-tight clothing used to emulate marble statues which was apparently also something that was done to create living statues in London's high-class brothels. I see. So she is one step above prostitution at the moment. Yes and no. At this point, she may have actually also been dabbling in prostitution. Mm -hmm. Unclear. Love it. Well, it's unclear because she also went on a sex binge, a road tour with the theater, contracted gonorrhea, and then ended up back at her aunt's at age 20. So it's like, how much of that sex was, like, just something she wanted to do to have fun versus making money? Maybe there was kind of a a blurring of that. Uh, You do hear also about people, you know, going into sex work because they are young and pretty and can make a lot of money and figure, why not? So I I can sense the similarity there between that and, and other people's stories. So according to one biographer... Although she was an avid consumer of sex, she saw herself as entitled to automatic compensation, as if she were a geisha on a mission providing an important social and cultural service. Yet asking for money for sex was distasteful to her, for that would assign her the stable identity of prostitute, ultimately halting her traversing of the sexual landscape. So that is... See, I've I've heard of other people from around that time period having similar understandings about sex. So it's interesting, like an interesting anthropological look into historical understandings of sex work. Yes, she was, instead of being labeled a prostitute, she at the very least was labeled a sexual adventuress, which I think she preferred. Mm -hmm. I love this. You can imagine her aunt was not amused. No, we might enjoy this this turn of events, and she might enjoy this turn of events, but her aunt wants her to be respectable. In an attempt to make her respectable, her aunt paid for acting lessons, and I hope also to get rid of the STD, though treatments were still primitive. Yeah, I don't really know what you do for gonorrhea, especially, like, pre-antibiotics. I mean, I guess you just kind of wait for it to go away. Gonorrhea never goes away. Untreated gonorrhea can lead to serious complications, so it is important to receive treatment. Huh, interesting. Did, does it say what the treatments would have been? Would it have been the standard, like, mercury or whatever? Or were there different treatments? I hadn't. I guess I hadn't thought of gonorrhea as, like, one of the more serious ones. I mean, I know that it, it's, like, gross, but... Gonorrhea was frequently treated with silver nitrate. So, which I've heard that silver can be bad for you in large doses, but is not one of the more toxic metals that you could be putting in yourself, so. I mean, I can't tell you definitively if it's better than putting mercury on genital sores. Well, um, I do know that, like, uh, you know those, those shiny, like, metallic sprinkles that you can put on candies and cakes and things? Those have silver in them. So it's at least, like, food grade. Uh, to some degree, at some level, whereas I don't think you find food-grade mercury anymore. 
Our protagonist then spent about a year in acting school. Unfortunately for her aunt, this did not go to plan. No? Really? She was apparently still quite poor because at this point it's speculated that she may have been supplementing her income with sex work. I mean, she already has figured out how to go about it, so makes sense. She also experimented with women, including a chorus girl. Anyone we know or not quite yet? Not anyone we know. It was apparently a very short fling. Also, it should be noted that while most would associate Weimar Berlin with a thriving gay underground, 1890s Berlin still had its clubs and balls. Ah, so Weimar Berlin did not uh, come out of the sea as Venus fully formed. It developed historically out of whatever this was. However, all was not lilacs and violets. She smoked a lot and didn't have much money for food. Also, contraceptives were illegal. Yet despite all the sex she had, she never fell pregnant or seemed to worry about it. Do we know why she didn't? The fact she was never pregnant is probably due to low body weight, as well as the lack of money for food, combined with encounters with venereal disease. Yeah, which would do it. Yeah, in early 1896, another wrench was thrown in as well. She caught syphilis. Oh, fun. And they don't have antibiotics yet. And syphilis, like, isn't just bad for, like, the genital region. That can make you go crazy and also lose parts of your body. Oh, yes. For those interested, syphilis bores holes not only through your brain, but through your skull. Love it. And, of course, you have the popular image uh, from way back when of people losing their noses and... Just a really fun disease. A doctor said it was secondary syphilis, meaning it was in the second of four stages of the disease, and she was then cured after six weeks with mercury. Big quotation marks around cured, though, because as far as I know, mercury could address symptoms, but could not cure the disease. So the weird thing is, the initial source of syphilis actually might go away on their own, but also mercury kills basically everything. So, like, it would kill the syphilis that you could see, but it would also kill healthy things. Mm. Does not sound fun. Um, And, of course, there is still the the potential of the syphilis coming back later, which is, you know, in the later, later stages that it could potentially come back. The way they make it sound throughout the following decades, it seems like the syphilis never actually left, but she didn't lose her nose or go insane. After her stint in a public hospital, she ran into the avant-garde. There she met a man named Stefan George. Now, George was a linguist prodigy, according to some, and had started a literary magazine. Through his circle, she met and became the mistress of Melchior Lecter. What a, sta- a name! <laughs> yes, a stained glass artist. There was a great deal of discussing poetry, plays, and Nietzsche, the philosopher who said God is dead. Though she enjoyed the art, the sex was not that good. Still recovering from the syphilis, or was he just not that good? <laughs> so the affair is described as symbiotic, but not passionate, because sex lacked excitement. Though his sensual theatrics were extravagant, his bedroom is described as a visual temple of sorts with sex mixed with art and Catholicism with paganism and Elsa functioning as a pagan Madonna. Wow, that sounds really cool. (laughs) I I can see why she stayed with him, even if the sex wasn't that great. Because, like, guy puts in some effort. It sounds like she approaches this relationship with kind of a Martha Gellhorn barometer of, like, maybe the sex is abysmal, but the meeting of minds is where it's at. It's also at this point that uh, she is described as model, muse, and artistic collaborator, playing the roles of artist lover, hetere, dominatrix, and sadomasochistic sex partner, channeling the avant-garde through her sexual system and testing its limits while presenting her life as art. Wow. 
iconic and like so ahead of her time. In 1896, she met and fell in love for the first time ever, people say, with the playwright Ernst Hart. At the time, he may have been having an affair with a male archaeology professor. Oh, bye for bye. Either way, it ended bitterly in summer 1898, as she left him when everything soured. She then eloped with his friend. That that does sound like it ended poorly. Do you have any more information about what the time they had together, the, the like two years that they had together? Or He is described as an abusive lover. Gotcha. So when we say soured, we mean she realized that he was an asshole. And thank God she got out. One man documented that Ernst occasionally made use of a whip and routinely humiliated her with the impurity of her sexual history. God, that's so sad that, like, the first person she falls in love with is, like, abusing her like this. I think there was some payback when she eloped with his friend. <laughs> but uh, Ernst then wrote a play about her. It was not flattering. Her response was an equally unflattering portrayal in a novel a few years later, and all his friends read it. Yes, that's how artists get revenge. She then ended up in Naples, where she forced her way into the pornographic cabinet of the Naples Museum. Excuse me? It is not what you think. The cabinet actually contains ancient Roman artwork from Pompeii excavations. However, also remember that one sculpture found in a Victorian excavation of the site depicted the god Pan having sex with a goat. Mm -hmm. Considering the social attitudes, you see how women were barred from entering this part of the museum. Yeah, I mean, with their, their understanding of feminine sensibilities or whatever. Yes, but Elsa was having none of that. The bewildered guard was given a generous tip, though. Well, that's good, at least. By 1900, she's in Munich, and her timing was excellent. There was a flourishing arts scene. Many other women were studying art there, including Mina Loy, a friend of Juna Barnes. It's here that she also met and married the architect August Endel. He wasn't traditionally masculine. Some described him as sickly, but the two enjoyed intense discussions. But once again, sex got off on a wrong foot. To a woman who enjoyed a lot of sex and tried out all the different things, Endel was a bit impotent, as she thought of it. The fact she enjoyed being a dominatrix probably didn't help. Either way, in the summer of 1901, she proposed to him, and he accepted. Love that. <laughs> she just keeps on being, you know, progressive and ahead of her time. She didn't do much art during the marriage, though. She left that to her husband and called herself too lazy to be an actual artist. So did she end up being like a housewife in this, or what did she do? She basically calls herself an abysmal, an abysmal bored housewife. That being said, many considered her already to be an erotic artist, and she still hung out with all of the artists, including a man who enjoyed crossing obscenity laws as much as possible by reportedly urinating and masturbating on stage. As part of, like, a larger art piece, or just kind of walk on stage? <laughs> I would assume it is part of a larger art piece. I don't think there would be applause if it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Well, you know, with these people who, you know, in the avant-garde, they're trying to do anything to push the envelope, so. Still, the marriage she found herself in proved to be unsatisfying, and it was a problem of her own making. She was bored, and his endless stress over job, finance, and past trauma didn't help matters in the bedroom. So she negotiated the right to take a lover. I mean, it sounds like a band-aid solution, but okay then. And here she met Felix Paul Grev, also known as Frederick Philip Grove, a student of archaeology and Oscar Wilde's German translator. Ah, Oscar Wilde. Love when we run into him. He'd spent quite a lot of the previous years in homosexual affairs, but now he was trying to forge a heterosexual image. Endel introduced the two, 
apparently believing that Grove would never have an affair with his wife. He was wrong about that. So do we know if Grove is bisexual or just experimenting or what? It sounds like Grev was bisexual, but leaned more towards men. In this case, Elsa initiated the physical affair with him that Christmas. Her husband now became a chaperone on trips to Italy and East Africa. Finally, he had a botched suicide attempt before leaving miserably and taking half a year to recover from the emotional blow when he figured this all out. Wow, poor guy. Sounds like he needs some serious therapy. I mean, you'd said that there was previous trauma and... Meanwhile, Elsa and Grev stayed in Italy. However, that ended when he was arrested because a male lover discovered the money he sent him was being used to finance the affair with Elsa. So he ended up in prison for a year on fraud charges. Oh, of all the things... Endel arrived later to try and repair the marriage, but Elsa turned him away. She found a place to stay in Italy while Grev was in prison. Though her husband paid her 1,500 German marks, he reneged on his divorce promise, forcing her to cite her own adultery as the reason for divorce in 1904. Wow, so that is the end of that relationship pretty conclusively. Grev was finally let out of prison, Then they actually wrote a joint novel, published in 1905, and married in 1907 in Berlin. In 1909, she then helped him stage his own death and flee to Canada. Excuse me? Sounds fake, but okay. The reason was due to frustration at his editors and his low income. He figured he could be a millionaire in America, making it from the ground up. That doesn't usually happen to people. But okay, dude. Elsa would join him a year later in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. However, he abandoned her in late 1911. Why? So, if you look again to people's writings and see that they have used a lot of their own life to create the stories, there is a paranoia of successful women writers and sexual jealousy in his later works. There is also, from one novel, a possibility of domestic violence. On her part? Against him? It would appear to be him against her if we also look at some of her poetry. It's all quite confusing. So this is the way that artists distance themselves creatively from the literal truth of things that have happened to them. You could say that. We do know that she then moved into a tent in Virginia or Kentucky with some traveling African-Americans before landing in Cincinnati. Hmm. When you say traveling African-Americans, were they, did they have a particular job that they were doing, or what sort of people were they? It sounds like they were immigrating from the South to the North. Oh, so that's part of the Great Migration that you hear about. Now, Elsa never knew what happened to Grev, but he moved to Manitoba, Canada in 1912 and kept writing under the name Frederick Philip Grove. He declared himself a widower and then married a young school teacher in August 1914. It's unknown if he ever kept tabs on Elsa. Ah, but it sounds like he kind (laughs) of moved back into the mainstream and (laughs) abandoned his artist life to some degree. For our protagonist, we know that she left Cincy for New York in 1913 to marry Baron Leopold von Freytag Lorenhoven who was 11 years younger than her. Oh, wow, a catch. She was now a baroness, and that is how everyone knows her. Of course, she technically committed bigamy. Because Grev was still alive? On the other hand, if he faked his own death, then... Well, I don't think he faked his death twice, just the first time when she helped him. Right, no, I'm just saying, like, do people know that he's still alive? Well, he changed his name, so... And in the time before the internet. It was hard to track people down, so. Yeah, also gets harder when you declare false information and that ends up on government papers as fact. Yeah, so I guess we'll put a pin in that and see if that comes back to bite her or not. Leopold, though, was not in the best situation himself. 
He worked as a busboy in New York and was forced to pawn his family's coat of arms. Wow. So so the Baron thing is very much title rather than the rest of it. Yeah, he basically lived off of Elsa. How How did this go down for both of them? I mean... Well, it was a very short marriage because World War I started. He left to enlist in the German army to regain his honor and took her savings with him. Um, excuse me, dude? Entitled much? They would never meet again. Understandably, she keeps on meeting these assholes. He would be captured early on and spend four years as a prisoner of war. He was then interred in Switzerland in 1918 and committed suicide in May 1919. What does she do now that she's been left stranded alone in America? She brings Dada to the U.S. before the first Dada experiments performed in Zurich, actually. Wow. So when you say brings Dada to the U.S., does she, like, know practitioners of Dada from Europe? Is she inventing this? What is the story with her and Dada? So she is influenced by all of the artists she met earlier in Germany. And a lot of them, a lot of what they would do would also influence the European Dada, but hers is a different flavor of it. Now, as to what Dada is, it's a movement that rejects the logic, reason, and aesthetics of modern capitalist society, instead expressing nonsense, irrationality, and anti-bourgeoisie protest in their works. Another way to put it is that Dada is very weird. I'll say. <laughs> she used costumes a lot. Throughout World War I, she created outfits and reactions to events. You could find her on the subway with a French infantry helmet on her head. She made sculptures out of trash she found in the street. These objects also made their way into her costumes. Though she also wrote poetry, her main medium is her own body, and a lot of her work is sexual, erotic, scandalizing. So it's really pushing the boundaries of what you can consider art, and what, what is obscenity, what is indecent. Yes, and naturally, this didn't make much money, if any. Yeah, no, it's you're not like getting commissioned to do a portrait of a rich person. Which is how she ended up working in a cigarette factory. Huh, I wonder if that inspired any of her pieces. It certainly took some of her teeth because she left that job when she got into a fight that led to the loss of those teeth. And then she worked as an art model. And you can find nudes of her because of this. I love how, on the one hand, she is creating art with her body, and on the other hand, she is kind of selling the use of her body as an inspiration to create art. It's like this whole enmeshed mass of body and art there. She was also arrested because of her art. No, really? This might have been the time she was walking about only wearing a Mexican blanket, so she was arrested for public nudity, or it may have been a different incident. <laughs> One of many. I mean, it sounds like she's really trying to push boundaries here, so that makes sense. As Margaret Anderson tells it, Tired of official restraint, she leaped from patrol wagons with such agility that policemen let her go in admiration. She shocked people, basically. So, for instance, she shaved her head, slapped vermilion red on it. Her makeup included yellow face powder, black lipstick, and an American stamp on one cheek. There were teaspoons for earrings, buttons for rings, tomato cans for accessories, an electric battery taillight bounced on the back of her bustle. She turned her body and apartment into a living museum from the refuse of New York City. There was also a vegetable costume. Excuse me? Long before Lady Gaga wore a dress made out of raw meat, the Baroness used carrots and beets. I feel like that's gotta smell better, for one thing. There was also the occasional live canary. Where? I imagine as an accessory, like on her shoulders or head. That's the only way I can imagine it. Mm -hmm. That that makes some sense. Wow, so it sounds like she is really devoted to this idea of shocking art, that it's not just 
like she she's not trying to make herself look good. She's trying to uh, pose questions to viewers and, and have them think about things seriously. She then met the journalist and writer Juna Barnes in the middle of World War I. Barnes reported about her entrance to a ball. One sees the Baroness leap lightly from one of those new white taxis with 70 black and purple anklets clanking about her secular feet. A foreign postage stamp, cancelled, perched upon her cheek. A wig of purple and gold caught roguishly up with strands from a cable once used to more importations from far cafe. Red trousers, and catch the subtle, dusty perfume blown back from her. An ancient human notebook on which has been written all the follies of a past generation. She has been described as an assemblage of paradoxes embodied in one body. Old and new, erotic and grotesque, European and American, human and technological, ancient and modern. You can really see where, like, Madonna or Lady Gaga or other kind of pop stars got some of it from. Barnes would later immortalize her as the Duchess of Broadback in Nightwood, one who expertly talks about living statues in Berlin. So Mm -hmm. harking back to our vaudeville episode here earlier. She also found her attractive. Oh? The Baroness, though, was intimidated when they first met, but they became good friends. Just good friends? Well, later on, as we'll see, there is what I would call an epistolary affair. Ah, so they they sexed. (laughs) We will see. Mm -hmm. Though others would also call Juna Barnes her lover at one point, but there's less mentioned about Elsa in Barnes' biographies. There's less sexual stuff mentioned about Barnes in Elsa's biography, so... So they're really close pen pals, is what you're saying. With an undercurrent of sexual tension? Love that. (laughs) Either way, there was a fake penis. (laughs) Excuse me? (laughs) Elsa would promenade in public, giant phallus in hand, quite possibly impersonating the same spirit and pose of a militant suffragette. (laughs) Do we have any info on, like, what she was trying to say with this? Well, you see, this is also the time when birth control activists were protesting, and in Elsa's case, she was apparently mocking the masculinist art world. You do hear a lot about that, like, uh, female artists talking about, like, why are these male artists, you know, building all of these... Um, phallic objects and painting all of these phallic things and you know the expression writing with one hand um there's some accusations of male artists doing similar things so I, I see that as a valid criticism and she did do quite a bit of criticizing in her own way there were also times she went touring but this is still world war one so she couldn't escape the prejudice against Germans at the time in the U.S. She was once arrested in Connecticut for espionage and jailed for three weeks. Somehow, I don't think that she would make a good spy considering how visible she is. Yeah, if you wanted a spy, you should maybe get a femme fatale, not someone who is getting arrested for public nudity, is wearing tomato cans as accessories and vegetables as a dress and walking around in public with a giant penis. Yeah, no, no. Despite all the, you know, quote unquote obscenity, she really doesn't seem bent on seduction so much as as artistic messages. You say that, but keep in mind, this woman never gave up sex. However, during the Connecticut stay, while they did finally figure out she is not a spy, She was also considered mentally deranged. That's their problem for not recognizing that women can be smart. I'm just saying. Keep in mind, this isn't long past the time where there's a list of reasons women are sent to insane asylums and it includes stuff like masturbation or lack of libido. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so very much the time of if a woman isn't doing what I personally want, then she must be crazy. And then in 1918, she became the star of The Little Review, the magazine of Jane Heap and Margaret Anderson. She was now a well-known fixture of the art world, 
There were also fears that the new Zurich Dada would follow the pattern of the Baroness's flamboyant feminine Dada. However, interwar America wasn't as welcoming with anti-obscenity laws and prohibition. For instance, there is the story of James Joyce's Ulysses and the Little Review trying to publish it and them ending up in court. And there was this whole big blowout. Elsa got caught up in that because she was promoting the book before it got banned. I love that that she and Joyce are kind of in the same milieu, that he isn't really a person that we think of as being part of our Paris Lesbos, but he is a creative at the time who was pushing boundaries. By 1922, though, she fell out with the Little Review as she believed the magazine was becoming too mainstream. Oh, not that. She proceeded to bomb them with poetry. What does that mean? So, for instance, when they did an entire issue about an Italian-American painter and excluded her work, she berated the painter, calling him an American man of business, not an artist. The Americanism of Stella, the industry for vain results, the industry of vanity, and Stella, conceit, and money, a well-known name brings... And it continues on like that. Wow, so... She's calling him a sellout. So basically, she just wrote a bunch of poetry and sent it all to them. Being like, you are too mainstream, you're a sellout, you're not a true artist. I love it. Even her hate mail is artistic. Anyway, speaking, continuing about her art, there's also a drawing of what basically amounts to a urinal as a fountain. And a sculpture called... God, if I remember correctly, which is, it just looks like a plumbing pipe. Yeah, I think I've seen that. Um, Now, does she have a connection to Duchamp and his urinal? He does come up, yes. So yes, they did know each other, they were aware of each other, and they did also influence each other. For instance, Elsa's biographer writes that Duchamp's use of his own body for art was no doubt inspired by the Baroness's original use of her body and costumes for gender scripting. And yet we hear more about Duchamp. Interesting. I wonder why the male Dada guy is is more prominent. Probably due to a lack of biographies and also just Elsa being considered batshit insane and just so very weird, (laughs) as we have seen. In 1923, she actually returned to Berlin believing she'd have an easier time making money there. Jane Heap arranged her passage by ship in third class as the Baroness was now once again broke. Uh, This was perhaps the worst timing on her part. The devastated German economy did not hold money for her. Yeah, no, one one wouldn't expect success out of that. Uh, Did she get anything out of this trip, though? Well, she started it by meeting up with her cousins. She hated them. She found the same class structure as she remembered from her youth, and she still hated it. Now she was miserable and broke. She tried haunting the aged male artists from the turn of the century, including her ex-husband Endel. You can imagine that didn't go well. She then proceeded to curse Jane Heap for putting her on the ship. Oof. And meanwhile, Elsa was the one who actually wanted to go to Germany. That shows you what happens when you make decisions out of nostalgia. Barnes and the Baroness were still writing to each other. At this point, Barnes had her own problems in the form of Thelma Wood. But the Baroness was also sending her tons of Dadaist artwork from Germany while Juno was in Paris. Mm -hmm. In 1924, Elsa suggested she become Barnes' private secretary as a means to get a visa application for France. Ooh, a titled secretary. That's fun. This plan never happened. Barnes did market Elsa's poetry, toting it around Paris to everyone. This led to Peggy Guggenheim sending her a one-time grant. I love how we, like, only ever encounter Peggy Guggenheim as, like, this fairy godmother of the art world. (laughs) Just, like, giving people the money to stay afloat. There was then a sort of fantasy marriage. When Thelma Wood gave Barnes a doll as a symbolic child of their relationship, Elsa proposed a book for theirs. 
Ah, so kind of extending that metaphor of a meeting of minds. Yes, well, a lot of the letters to Barnes from Elsa were very almost romantic in a way. There's like calling her my sweet or that sort of thing. So this is what I meant by an epistolary affair. Yeah, so they were like, it, it's like the people now that you have on, you know, long distance relationships via the internet where they are constantly writing things to each other and feel deeply for each other, but may have only met in real life a couple of times. Barnes would eventually try writing Elsa's biography, but no one would publish it, so she abandoned it. The bulk of that material would be used decades later to form a published biography written by someone else. But so, so she is, as much as she is making waves in the art world, she does not find like mainstream recognition as much. In 1925, the Baroness was living in a homeless shelter. She was actually thrown out for refusing to work, being ill, and violating the rules. Yeah, I'd imagine she'd be violating the rules. That's like all she does. She was then put in an asylum. But again, she wasn't insane. No, she just doesn't like to follow the rules. During this time, she wrote a large chunk of an autobiography. So at least she still knows her own worth. In 1926, she actually received an inheritance from an aunt and a visa for France. So this is a good windfall and she ends up in Paris, she actually doesn't visit either Salon of the World of this podcast. So neither Gertrude Stein nor Natalie Barney, actually. Oh no, well they missed out, because goodness, she is, sounds like a change maker. The bad news, though, is she was also still poor, and this was not helped by the visa stating that she can't work. Why not? Bureaucracy? Love it! Love it! Everything that she was criticizing. On December 14th, 1927, she accidentally left the gas-burning stove on and gas spread as she slept. She suffocated to death. The funeral took place in January 1928. A biography of her wouldn't be published till 2002, and her writing was published as Body Sweats in 2011. Wow, that is a huge gap between when she was active and, and when things were published. I mean, A, she was not mainstream. B, I imagine many people's reaction was similar to my first reaction as I did this research, and that was, what the fuck did I just read? <laughs> yeah, she certainly does not try to appeal to a mainstream audience, so I, I can see where that resists uh, easy rationalization or even commercial success. Thank you for listening. Subscribe. And remember, if you are upset with the world, you too can wave around a giant fake penis in the streets. <laughs>